Thanks for joining for the first ever Federal Social Media Week. I'm Gabrielle Pret, Senior Media Advisor for the U.S. General Services Administration and lead for SocialGov, the federal government social media community of practice. Thanks for joining today. This is the final session of Federal Social Media Week, session seven, using social media influencers in the federal government. We'll be hearing uh, for the US, from uh, Kendall Johnson, Brianna Kaya, and Yolanda Bird of the U.S. Census Bureau. Kendall serves as Executive Director for the 2020 Census Integrated Communications Contract. Ken Kendall's federal government service spans more than three decades. She previously served as the Contracting Officer's Representative on the Census 2000 Advertising Contract and the 2010 Census Communications Contract. She also worked for the Office of National Drug Control Policy, where she served as the Deputy Associate Director for the National Youth Anti-Drug Media Campaign, while simultaneously overseeing the media contract for that program. Yolanda serves as Deputy Chief in the Promotions Branch in the Center for New Media and Promotions. Yolanda has worked at the Census Bureau for the last year and a half. She previously worked at the MGM National Harbor where she managed their social media accounts. Before her three year stint at MGM National Harbor, she worked with NAR, The Washington Post, and FW Magazine, assisting with social media, advertising, and photography. Brianna serves as the Deputy Division Chief for the Center for New Media and Promotion at the US Census Bureau, where she manages digital communications for the Census Bureau. She also she was also involved in creating social media, partnership strategies, and messaging for the 2020 Census. Her background includes more than 13 years working at the Census Bureau in media, public relations, education and training, national partnerships, and promotions. Additionally, for two years, Brianna served as the digital director at the US, US Office of Personnel Management. A quick reminder that this session today is being recorded. Captioning is available via link sit in the chat box by the digital gov team. If you have any technical issues, um, please send a direct a redirect chat to the digital gov team um, and they can help you out. We will be taking questions at the end. We have 15 minutes for questions. So go ahead and send them send them in the chat box. And please remember to take our feedback survey um, that we send out when the session is finished. Um, so it's time for a couple warm up polls digital gov team if you want to launch the polls. So the first one is, have you used influencers at your agency? Tell us, yes, you have, no, you haven't, or if you're not sure. And do you see any use for influencers at your agency? Yes, no, I'm not sure. And while everyone's voting, I'm gonna check and see who's uh, joined us today. Wow, we have a lot of folks joining in. That's great, Department of State's on, City of Dallas is on. Queen Anne's County Government in Maryland's on, National Science Foundation. Uh, Marine Corps is on, that's great. U.S. Patent Trade Mark Office, uh, National Cancer Institute, Noah is joining us today, Travis County, Texas, CDC, FAA is on, great. A couple of folks from FAA, National Park Service, that's great. Mount Rainier, wonderful. GSA folks, my friends at GSA, NIH, Inter-American Foundation is on today, City of Lexington, Wow, we have a great mix of go uh, federal government and uh, our friends from state, state and local governments have showed up today too. That's wonderful. So let's see the results from our poll. First question, have you used influence at your, influencers at your agency? 24% of the, the folks who responded said yes, they had. 55% no, said no and 21% were not sure. The second question, do you see a use for influencers? 67% of you responded, uh, yes, you did uh, see, a, I'd see a use for them at your agency. 2% said no, and 32% uh, weren't sure. So I will uh, go ahead and turn it over uh, to Brianna, uh, Yolanda, and Kendall. Good afternoon, this is Kendall Johnson, and uh, thank you for this opportunity. Um, we were excited when you asked us to, um, to present, so thank you. Um, I wanted to start off by saying that uh, our, our campaign was different from most in that our target audience was everyone. It wasn't a subset of the population, it was everyone. 
Um, and we had to be particular in how we spoke to the different segments of the, uh, of the, of the population uh, because one message was not the right message for everybody. One mode of communication was not the best, best mode for everyone. So this was a very tailored, um, complex, multilingual, multimode uh, uh, communications campaign. That said, um, because we had to talk to everybody, we went out and we did a lot of research. And one of the things we wanted to know was, first of all, what are your barriers to responding to the census? What would, what would encourage you to respond? Uh, who would you listen to? Who do you want to deliver those messages? And how do you receive your messaging? So that gave us a lot of, a lot of information on methods and modes of which to communicate to the various audiences. And we, we, we did this with all, you know, a good uh, a cross section of the population. We determined that um, based upon feedback from all of this research, most people did not want to see celebrities as spokespersons for encouraging them to, encouraging them to respond to the census. That's because they felt that they're being paid. So if they're being paid, they probably don't really believe it, but they're doing it for the money. And that's not a surprise to us. We heard that before. So we shied away from celebrities. Um, in some cases, we used them, but they were more like, um, uh, like for Hawaii, for example, there are a lot of Hawaiian celebrities because it meant more to that culture than um, to other cultures. Uh, so what we determined was we would not do paid celebrity um, uh, in, uh, marketing, right? So we would do influencer marketing, but we would piggyback on the different platforms that we were already purchasing media. So um, I'm gonna go to the next slide. And um, I wanted to make sure you clear that, slide number three, sorry. Um, we actually spent a lot of time making sure that all of our messaging was culturally relevant, um, culturally sensitive, culturally diverse. Um, we, we advertised in multiple languages. Um, so, you know, the swath of, of uh, opportunity was great. Uh, we used uh, celebrity, uh, the influencers that we used, like, they, like I said previously, were tied to the platforms, the digital platforms that we were already purchasing media on. And while they were celebrities in their own right, they were not celebrities of the ca uh, caliber of a John Legend or uh, um, um, a Lady Gaga or somebody like that. Um, we relied on our partners to use those large um, or very famous celebrity uh, influencers to promote the messaging. That did not come from the Census Bureau. And that worked out perfect because the message was more authentic the way it came across. For our um, online or digital influencing, influencer marketing, we went to... Um, some of those celebrities on those or some of those influencers on those sites that had a varying degree of followers and then we could be very particular in the audience that we went to we could be more strategic in which audiences received which messages from which influencers so it was really great for us um, we found that reaching the young and mobile population which is one of our undercounted populations or hard to count populations was um, much easier when we did it uh, online using um, uh, uh, influencers from these platforms and our site direct buys, which you know allowed us to use content um, that it was that would engage the style of the developers was much more effective. So in the next couple of slides, we're going to talk about the outcomes of that and we're going to show you uh, some examples of the work that we did. But it was real important to note that the messaging for the most part came from real people and a lot of the social media influencers are actually real people they're even though they're very popular in their on those platforms they are considered real people they don't they're not considered as paid influencers and so they're much more believable their audiences um were the audiences that we considered hard to reach and it was it ended up being very very successful for us so i'm going to ask brianna to talk about some of the outcomes of those um, influencer activities. <clears throat> Next slide.
I think we might have lost Brianna. Uh, oh, maybe. Uh, really, oh, sorry, I'm, there she is. <laughs> sorry, my mine uh, timed out, so I had to uh, uh, go um, back to that. So, um, sorry, I missed what Kendall was just saying at the the for the last piece of it. But the influencer campaign, I would just say for the digital side, we really wanted to make, like, like Kendall had said before, we were really focusing on that, um, those hard to count populations, the populations that we would not normally reach with our um, larger traditional uh, media campaign. We also wanted to make sure that, because um, this was the first time that we were diving into the influencer um, kind of place of it, that we were really doing the research and really making sure that the audiences that we were reaching out to were those authentic kind of voices. Uh, like Kendall said before, because we had done the research from the beginning, we really understood that um, we had, that this could not sound, of course the influencers were being paid, but that, that they really believed in um, the content that they were promoting for us. So, um, we timed it so that these voices were happening during the, the promotional phase of it when our other advertising uh, was going on. So it was really magnifying kind of the content that was already out there um, and that they were getting it on places that maybe they wouldn't normally see with their, but, but for example, we had the ads that were running on YouTube, but like the influencers that we focused on were on sites like BuzzFeed or sites like Vice or um, on Instagram. We had um, uh, all of those things work together at the same time to really expand the reach of the messaging that was already out there. Um, our content creation, we really, to be, to have that authentic voice and to really, um, look at what research had told us about making sure that this was actually something that um, they believed in. It wasn't just something that they were being paid to do. So we had to really make sure that the influencers that we partnered with um, would not only reach those audiences, but would still have that authentic voice that maybe like if we had hired a celebrity, some of that disconnect would be there. Um, creative direction um, and execution, we really had to rely on them if we had gone in and told them exactly what to have said, I think we would have lost that authenticity that we really wanted to get with that influencer campaign. So both our site direct and the influencing uh, marketing efforts were highly successful. There was not a, even for myself, like uh, being on social or having friends and just kind of the, um, the reach that we got, the people that were were engaging with us and responding to these, um, it was high, we saw it everywhere. And we saw the success of that campaign just from the amount of people that were then engaging with us and the amount of people that we saw uh, with signups. Uh, for example, um, on the day that we had um, a, a large percentage of these influencer campaigns going out, we also had a push on Facebook and we, we could see in real time with the data um, the amount of people that were uh, going to the site and, and participating in the census. So I think we can go to the next slide. Oh, and so I think Yolanda, are you there? Yes. Okay, so I think Yolanda is now gonna walk us through some of the examples of some of these things, uh, of some of the influencer campaign that we had out there. Hi everyone, I'm Yolanda. So one of the examples we're gonna to show today is, um, I would have to say one of my favorite um, campaigns that we did with the influencers. It's puppies and kittens. Everyone loves puppies and kittens. Um, can you go ahead and play? Um, digital Gov team, we're not having any sound on the video. Hey guys, this is Danya Duchess, and this is the 2020 census explained by puppies, kittens, and a pregnant lady. <laughs> Yeah. 
Oh my god. This is gonna be way too much fun, you guys. Thanks, buddy. This year you can complete the 2020 census online or by phone or by mail. That's great. This is the first year that it's available online which makes it easy for me because I can sit here and play with the puppies as much as I want. College students who live away from home should be counted at the on or off campus residence where they live and sleep most of the time. The 2020 census will inform how we spend hundreds of billions of dollars in federal funds every year. Pet stores can use 2020 census data to help decide where to put new stores. They like the facts. <laughs> Oh my god. One of the things census data will help inform is where to build new roads. Hey, fresh concrete. <laughs> Thank you. The census never asks for social security or credit card numbers. So that means your stuff is protected, okay? <laughs> oh my god, it's happening. Oh. oh. The 2020 census doesn't count pets. Oh man. But it does count everyone living in the 50 states, DC, and five US territories. Even newborn babies need to be counted, even if they're still in the hospital. The census determines how many seats in the House of Representatives each state gets. Good thing to know. Will you help me get one? Guys, this is harder than I thought. <laughs> Wait. Ooh, okay. This is happening. Go for it. The results of the 2020 census will inform how billions of dollars in federal funding are allocated to many programs, including Medicaid, Head Start, grants for mental health services, and so much more. Thank you for that. <laughs> the U.S. Census Bureau is bound by law to protect your answers and keep them strictly confidential. Did you give me a fact? It's important to count all your roommates on the census. And there you have it. Make sure you complete the 2020 census. As you can see, that was one of the best um, campaigns that I have seen. I think I'm biased because I love puppies and kittens. But on BuzzFeed, it performed really well. It earned um, over 8 million impressions, um, which uh, was well over our guaranteed number of impressions of 5 million. And it surpassed average video um, completion rate by 2.3 times as much. Um, and Vice, it surpassed our performance goals by 100% with 22.9 million impressions. And um, Twitter Art House influencers, it got over 45 million impressions and 5 million link cl clicks. Um, this campaign, um, as you know, it touched all the points, the key points, the talking points that we wanted to share with everyone. And it was a cool new way to um, engage our followers um, instead of the normal uh, statistics or anything like that. It was just a, a new way uh, in a, that, we, that it did really well. Um, we can go to the next slide. So if you have any questions for the social media team, you can email us here. And also you can drop all your questions um, below in the chat and we can um, answer them. We've got a couple great questions that have come in already. Um, I have a question actually, I would like to know. So for the 2010 census campaign, uh, did you use influencers on social for that campaign or was 2020 the first time that you had done this? In 2010, we, used, we didn't use that much digital at all. Digital uh -huh. was a very small fraction of our communications budget. So the answer would be no, um, not in 2010. It's incredible to think how different everything must have been for uh, the 2010 census. I know that some of you were at census were around for both too. Um, so that's incredible to see like how much things have changed in the last um, 10 years. For using influencers for the 2020 census, um, how far, when did you think of this idea? Like how many years earlier? Well, you know, for the most part, the Census Bureau, we, we are planners. I mean, we yeah. plan, we're already planning for the 2030 Census. I mean, mm -hmm. we do not sit on our laurels. Uh, but the thing about um, paid media, right? Uh -huh. and, and it's difficult because the media landscape changes so quickly. And we were very clear up front um, when we were talking, when we were, you know, um, laying out our plans within the Bureau that 
There would be things that would happen at the last minute that we couldn't plan for. We might have to make mm -hmm. use of different modes of communication. And um, I'm telling you, the, the pandemic uh, really uh, put a hitch in our giddy up, so to speak. It was, um, we had to totally change course in um, how we were delivering the message as well as in some cases, what that message was. Um, because, you know, it, it changed people's, uh, it didn't change their perception of the Bureau. It just, the, the census was no, no longer important. Um, it just, it was just felt, and understandably, it fell way down on that list of things that we right. needed to do. I know, it's terrible that the pandemic timed with the 2020 census. It's like, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It was, I mean, it was a blessing mm -hmm. and a curse. I mean, people were home right. and, and we, you know, having the digital aspect of being able to, to respond really, really helped us. Mm -hmm. uh, that said, for our normal, all of our other uh, creative assets, for the talent, we have, you know, we have to do background checks, we have to do all of that, because we have to be careful who is speaking on behalf of the Census Bureau. Um, when we decided to do influencers, we realized that um, the va there are influencers that have, uh, that really speak to the audiences that we tried to reach, well, that we needed to reach, that, um, either were not uh, open to having a background check or um, had things in their background that the Bureau had to stop and say, wait a minute, is this something that we can move forward with? We couldn't, we couldn't, we couldn't hold such stringent requirements for 2020 as, as we did in previous um, censuses. So uh, as we move further into the, the collection period, the data collection period, and we realized that response was not where we wanted to be. We ramped up the idea about the influencers. We needed to speak to those particular audiences. The influencers were, they were on point. They were um, very active. They uh, were very interested in helping. And so it was like a marriage for us. It was made in heaven. It just worked out perfectly. And with the pandemic, everybody was home. They were on their, their computers. They were watching TV. They were not out and about. So we couldn't reach them through events. You know, anything that happened outside the home was not likely to um, work in our favor in terms mm -hmm. of, of um, encouraging people to respond. So while we did consider influencers early on, the further we got into the campaign, the more important they became and the more we utilize that option. Mm -hmm. Kudos to your yeah. team for pivoting and um, adapting and being agile, you know, and using new modern communications tactics. We did spend a lot of time pouring over um, each of the influencers though. And, and mm -hmm. um, while we were more open to some things that we, to be quite honest, we may not have been as open to before, um, because of the reach of the influencers, it was more important than ever for us to make sure that we got, um, or because of the, because of COVID and because of um, the election and the noise that was going on, it was more important than ever than that we get, got out there and got the message out there that, that people could respond. And then once that, um, that time frame for people responding got extended as well, it, it was just, it was vital that people knew um, how to respond to the census and how important it was. That's great. Um, I would like to say that our campaign was complemented by a lot of campaigns that were done by our partners and other interested yeah. parties because you know, we can't, we couldn't do it all. I mean, we yeah. did a lot, but we could not do it all. And our partners and other organizations could say things that we couldn't say, or they could put things in, in words that we couldn't use, so to speak. We are still the federal government. We still have to be particular in what we say and how we say it, but that did not, they also were not required to follow the stringent guidelines that we had. They could use whichever influencers they wanted, which really helped to augment all that we were doing. Because then it became not just a surround sound of messaging, it also became a very broad use of all types of influencers. So that it, it did look like a much more cohesive campaign, even though um, while we gave them some of our assets to use, like the tagline and the logo and the talking points and things like that, we were all saying the same thing. And that was the yeah, beauty of this whole campaign. Mm -hmm. That's great. Uh, we got a great question in the chat box from Miranda. She said, I'm curious about how agencies have negotiated influencer terms. Um, for an example, can the agency uh, use content they've created, uh, like for your uh, content, 
Um, can they use that for an unlimited time or a limited time? How do you create and negotiate influencer terms? So for us, it was tied to the media by itself. And as long as that media was running or as long as we were in market, we had the use of that asset. Um, uh, you think about like if you're doing a regular um, uh, uh, ads using SAG talent, you do paper talent through a certain period of time. We agreed that we would only use the, uh, the ads for a certain period of time. The, the influencers themselves could use it as often as they wanted. But for us, we would, once the period of, of advertising was over, we, would, we wouldn't use it anymore. Mm -hmm. So we didn't buy out the talent. We didn't buy out the use rights or anything like that. Mm -hmm. um, it was a point in time. Almost. Sounds like you guys work pretty closely with your attorneys. Is that true? <laughs> you must have good relationships. We work very well with our attorneys, uh -huh. but also we had ad agencies. So we didn't okay. we, the Census Bureau were not out negotiating all of this. We had media okay. buying agencies that did this on our behalf. Okay. Okay. That's good to know too. And we, we have processes in place because of that media, um, mm -hmm. the, the guys that we do every 10 years. And Kendall is amazing at that work. So <laughs> Great. Great. We have a question that came in from Carrie. She asks, uh, did you have any uh, issue? Did you have an issues management plan in case any of the influencers did something that discredited them or made the census look bad? What was your contingency plan to deal with that? Well, yeah, so know. we no, go, go ahead, Kendall. No. I was just going to say we were ready for that piece of it um, because going into it, we knew inherently that was a risk that we were were going to have to take. But we actually had kind of a risk issues um, management process in place just for like media and for the census in general, because we're very used to having a lot of partnerships, a lot of people working on behalf of the census. And so we kind of have to have that ready to go um, regardless. So we kind of took that um, and then absorbed it into the, the influencer uh, campaign thing. But we spent, I, uh, quite a bit of a time vetting those partners beforehand so that we were not partners, but influencers beforehand um, too, so that we would, um, so that we kind of knew what we were getting into. You, you can't see everything, but it actually worked out a lot um, better than, we didn't have many of those issues. So. <laughs> how, how did you guys find and choose the influencers that you used for the 2020 campaign? Well, since we, we used influencers that were tied to um, platforms that we were already purchasing as part of the media buy, okay. um, the uh, platform themselves would provide us with a list of influencers that were willing to do it, right? It, okay. It didn't, we could pick and choose, but if they didn't, they didn't want to do it, it didn't matter. So uh -huh. they would provide us with a list. And based upon uh, what we agreed to do with them, right, if it was just them you know, uh, uh, sharing the message, or if it was like the puppies and kittens video, mm -hmm. we would, um, we could determine how many we could use. So that was part of the ne negotiation. And okay. then we would choose the ones, let's say we needed five, we would choose 15. Because we still have to do the, 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 the minimum background vetting. And if any fell out of the list, I mean, we did them in priority order. And as they, if they fell out because of something in their background that we just couldn't support, um, then we would just go to the next one. So we, we started off with a larger pool so that when we whittled it down, we would have enough people um, that had a good following and reached the audiences that we needed to reach. Who did the and background? Remember, we had oh, audiences that we were trying to reach. So for mm -hmm. example, that video on the puppies and kittens, what's really important to us is that we make sure that mothers are uh, people know about like newborn babies need to be counted because um, those are some of our undercounted populations because they just don't realize. Um, so we picked influencers who would be able to reach those populations for us. So we thought it was, I mean, it was the best of both worlds having somebody who was pregnant also with puppies and kittens, like, because we could get that message across about young children um, counting. But then also, um, for example, we chose something like BuzzFeed or, um, maybe some outlet outlets we normally probably wouldn't just like as a census bureau as an institution because we were going for those young and mobile and hard to count populations so instead of just picking media outlets or influencers that kind of like fit us we had to really choose ones that that reached the populations that we were trying to count um, which 
more outside of maybe like the more mainstream media buys that we were doing. Mm -hmm. um, how did you conduct the background checks? Was that done through your ad buy? Did you guys use the OPM? Was that uh, your security office at Census? No, it was done through the ad agency. That was okay. part of their job to vet um, the the to vet all of the talent and come back to us if there was anything questionable. Give us the opportunity to make a decision. Okay, but not to, but we had criteria. There are things, you know. Mm -hmm. I'll give you an idea. Not a lot of salacious content, right? <laughs> um, you know, we're still the federal government. You know, right. um, so there are things that we just absolutely could not condone. Uh, but we we bent the rules way more this time around than ever. And I've been around a long time. Um, and it was, it was, you know, it's, it was a mindset change. It was understanding that you've got to bend those rules in order to reach people. And, and for them to, for them to, to, to respect the fact that you went out of your way to, to talk to them in a relevant and credible voice that they were more receptive to hearing. I think that went a long way to encouraging response and, 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 and allowing people to um, self-respond as opposed to waiting for somebody to come to their door. That's great. Thanks, Kendall. Um, whose idea was it to use, uh, Winnie, in, Winnie in the chat box wants to know, whose idea was it to use puppies and kittens in the video? Uh, was it the influencers or uh, did you guys like look at your hard to reach populations and brainstorm that way? Or I'd That's like actually a segment that BuzzFeed, BuzzFeed does already. So uh -huh. Um, and it's one of their more popular ones. So they actually, when we were looking at the different things that we could use, there were some suggestions. And I have to say that as soon as we saw that one, that was like top of our list, right, Kendall? It was, it really was, yeah. Great. I have a, a question that came in in the chat box. Um, somebody commented that they were told at the state level, there was a lot of geo-targeting. Um, can you talk about it, maybe like how you looked at uh, hard to reach folks in different areas of the country and maybe how you integrated that into your campaign? Did you use any uh, maybe like influencers that were specific to a state or area? I know when we looked at our Instagram influencer campaign and some of the other ones, well, that was one of the things that we had our contractor divided out on so that we could see the different regional components to it to make sure that we were covering those areas. Um, I know Kendall can speak more on like the specific um, media pieces of some of the, the buys, but I know our contractors also when they, when, when they go out and make those um, purchases, they're also looking at that. Yes, we didn't have just one contractor. We had a we had a group of contractors because we realized that we again we're speaking to ver diverse audiences across the country. So we had to have a diverse group of contractors. Mm -hmm. um, so, for example, um, Culture One World was the agency that spoke to the Hispanic audience, and they would come to us with recommendations for influencers, you know, within the platforms that we were working and how they could, uh, who they would reach uh, specifically, what segment of the Hispanic population would, though, would that particular influencer uh, be most receptive to. And uh, so our partners or our, our, our contractors and our subcontractors were very much involved in that decision, uh, working with us. They didn't make those decisions on their own, but they worked with us and they provided us with enough information to uh, make really good uh, decisions uh, and to, uh, reach not only the different segments of the, each population, but uh, to, I'll use geo-target for lack of a better word, but um, specifically target the areas of the country where people were, even within a specific city, wherever we could use geo-targeting, we did. That's great, thanks. Um, Hillary in the chat box has asked a question I'm sure that we're all thinking. Uh, did you receive any pushback from leadership when you suggested using influencers or the puppies and kittens video or partnering with BuzzFeed, some of these like new media outlets? Um, she noted she thought this was brilliant. I think everybody agrees on that. And you know, did, you, did you get any pushback? How, how, what, was, what was your team's approach to um, you know, overcoming pushback? I think what, what has really worked in our favor is one, this is not the first time we've done a paid media campaign. So we, we've had hurdles every time we've done this. So by the time we got to 2020, um, a lot of the team that worked on 2010 was still there. Uh, they trusted our judgment. 
Uh, we had um, we had uh, leadership that had faith in us and allowed us to make those decisions um, because we had already laid out what our parameters were, what we absolutely would not um, accept or could not uh, condone and what we could. So, you know, if there was anywhere where we had, it was gray and we really needed to make sure before we move forward, we would talk to leadership and they would make that call. But we have very progressive uh, people in, on, in our leadership chain who were very, um, uh, 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 dig they were very digital savvy. So it was, it was not a big deal for us. I will say that Kendall and her team came to the table with a pretty good strategy and all of the reason and a plan. So that always helps when we're presenting to leadership when they see the thought and the strategy behind it and how that's going to help and benefit us. I, I, I have to say that that's a big part of it too. Right. I think that your leadership must have seen, seen the big reward was being able to fulfill your mission and you know you have to take measured risks and plan you know make contingency plans to be able to accomplish that and it's like what an awesome feat the census to you know have all this incredible content and be able to reach americans in a way that they're already familiar with they already get content in that way um, i think it's terrific uh, uh, um, uh mao in the question box has asked at the end of the video, uh, or any of the videos you produced, was there any attribution to the U.S. Census Bureau um, or your partners in creating the campaign? Uh, it was always clear that it was done, in, uh, many times they said it was done in conjunction with the U.S. Census Bureau, so it was very clear. We, you know, we made sure they knew that the message was coming from us or that we were working with that particular influencer or that platform to extend the message. Uh, we wanted to, we we tried to be as open and transparent and and as authentic as possible because the last thing we wanted anyone to think is that we were trying to um, uh, where we were we were we were we were being covert in in any of the actions that we were doing. So yes, there may not have been actual attribution, but it was clear when that that the content was coming from the Census Bureau and that the Bureau was involved in in the actual. Um, content that the influencers were, were, were using. Great, thanks. Um, Trina asked a great question here in the comment box. Have you compared previous years uh, for the census, you know, for the 2010 census and um, 2000, uh, when you didn't use influencers to this 2020 campaign? Um, and what, what, what do you have any feedback on your return on investment? So I think the funny thing is, is when each time we do a census, the landscape completely changes. So I think this time, um, something that would have been more effective, uh, like a media commercials, um, we did a Super Bowl um, ad they, they, um, in 2010, like those, those kind of campaigns, it's hard to compare them because that it's different. Um, I'm sure we will go back and, and be able to see some of those um, um, numbers, but just looking at the numbers like you saw from the slide before, um, just the interactions we had with like uh, single videos and, and those different pieces, uh, we were really um, excited, ex especially when you're talking about during um, an election year, during um, a pandemic, like there was just an opportunity for things to really get lost. Um, and I feel like the use of influencers really allowed us to make up some of the ground that we might have lost. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Brianna. Uh, we have a question from Shannon here. Uh, has Census navigate? Has Census ever used uh, like Instagram takeover type influencer interactions? Did you use that for the twenty twenty though? So we've done. Um, some things with partners, um, but for the most part, we let our partners kind of do those different pieces. Um, Yolanda can speak a little bit more about the actual like Instagram um, events that we had because we had a few of those. Um, but actually, like having the influencers take over um, our accounts, that wasn't something that we employed mm -hmm. uh, for this one. Yolanda, did you have anything to add about that? Um, no, I'm just picking back in off of what you said, Bree. Um, 
we never had an influence take over our Instagram channel itself, but we did do events where we did Instagram stories um, and partner with different partners for um, the 2020 census um, events. Were you guys able to do any live events? I mean, I know the pandemic has kind of disrupted <laughs> maybe what would have been our normal strategy. Were you able to do any live events? That's we like did that. have a couple of live events. Yolanda, did you want to say anything about that? Yes. So we did um, a couple live events with um, different partners. Um, SIS um, did a couple um, for 2020 census uh, where uh, census attended the event. We showcased it on Instagram stories, Facebook stories, and all our platforms. Um, it was a hit. Um, we got most of our engagement um, using Instagram stories, which is pretty cool. And if you want to go and see any of the past Instagram stories from 2020 census, just go to our uh, census page for Instagram and go to our highlight reel. Everything is saved there so you can take a look at um, the different things that we did with the partners for um, the campaign. Cool. I chatted that link to the, their Insta Census Bureau Instagram if you all want to check it out. Um, I think we have time for one last question. This comes in from Camille. She'd like to know um, what tools did you utilize to measure your campaign progress and success? So we had a couple of things. Um, we had, we did, you know, uh, pre-surveys and post-surveys, so to speak. Um, we, uh, while we were in market, we had um, uh, uh, an ongoing uh, survey that just gauged people's um, level of, of um, interest in participating. What was the likelihood that they would participate if they had not already participated? Um, it was, we, we call that the tracking survey. Um, and then we were watching real-time response rates. Uh, and we, we could see if there was a spike in response rates on a particular day it, uh, tied to something that we had done like through one of the influencers. So if, it was a, if we got great volume on puppies and kittens on the, the day or the days that it ran, you would see the spike in the, um, in the response rate, believe it or not. Or even into, if not necessarily the response rate, you see the spike in the visits to 2020census.gov. So, I mean, we use those and, you know, of course, click-throughs and all the other regular normal metrics that you would use for anything um, digital. Yolanda, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? No, I think you covered it. Um, we did see various engagement depending on what we posted that day, which was pretty cool to see real time. Um, some of the platforms that we did use to measure engagement, um, we use Sprinkler and we can see how the post did and what went out that day. And just to see the numbers, um, it was pretty amazing. Did you all get any, um, uh, you know, like metrics or analytics back uh, from the influencers that you used or your ad buy companies? Did they provide information for you as well? In some cases, yes, they did. Not always. Mm -hmm. um, uh, like, as you can see, you, in, the, uh, on, in the slide deck on slide five, we talk about um, uh, the number of impressions that we got, for example, on Vice in, in one of our um, uh, uh, one of our, um, I don't even know what to call it, but one of our integrations with their influencers uh, count us in and uh, we had over 4.6 million views. Um, and it, again, it's, they, they quoted us what they thought would, it, how it would perform, right? But it surpassed our performance goals by 100%. Oh, that's great. So, so there, were, there were snippets, it all depended. Um, and then it all depended on what that integration was. For example, we did concert series, um, uh, Brandy, uh, uh, did a, uh, we did Brandy, we did, um, oh my goodness, they, Luke, all the names are skipping, right now just went out of my brain, I apologize, but we did some, uh, some music videos, uh, music programs, we did some, some concerts, uh, we did, um, uh, 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 Caribbean uh, music festivals. So all of these interactions online using the influencers for those platforms really were uh, very well accepted, very well attended events. And it got to the point where people were calling us, our partners saying, can we use that in what we're doing, right? And we're like, oh, unfortunately not. That's, you know, we're not able to share that, but uh, yeah. We got we got we got some metrics, and um, we'll be able to 
uh, we're in the process now of doing our post buy analysis and all of our um, reviews of everything that happened, and we'll be able to put out some some more information, a compilation of information. It sort of gives you an overarching view of exactly how successful we were in our communications efforts, at least from a delivery perspective. Wow, that's uh, fascinating. So between now and the 2030 census, do you tell all everybody you worked with see you in 10 years, or you guys have some integrated like uh, evergreen content to you know keep pushing forward? Well, we always have uh, evergreen content. It just won't be in that. It will not be in the volume that we had for the uh, for the 2020 census. I mean, it is our goal to stay as relevant as we can. Um, in people's minds, and, and it's difficult when you when you have a census that happens every 20, every 10 years, people tend to forget. But let's remember, that's not all we do. We do so many surveys, hundreds of surveys every year. Um, so we're, we're there, we're just not, we're, we're, we're only talking to a subset of the population, not necessarily um, uh, the entire population. We have an economic census that happens every five years. That's we deal directly with businesses, and that's in years ending in two and seven. So um, we're gearing up for that one now. Um, we've got uh, the American Community Survey, which years ago we used to have uh, two components to the census: a long form and a short form. And the long form went to a uh, sample of the population, whereas the short form went to everyone. Uh, because we found that those that use the information for, from the long form required the information to be more current than every 10 years, we pulled that out of the census itself and we now do a rolling survey every month. Um, uh, uh, it's random, people who, who are selected are random, you could get one and no one else on your block was selected. So it almost makes, it, makes you feel like it's not real, but you, know, you can always come to the Census Bureau and check to see whether or not uh, any, you know, anything you receive is legit. That said, we have the ongoing American Community Survey. We have, um, you know, really? the unemployment. Oh, say that again. New numbers released this week. Oh yes, <laughs> yes, we did. Yes, and um, you know, the, the, the unemployment uh, figures that are uh, uh, quoted each month. Um, we do the work for that. We don't necessarily report it, but we're out there. The ones we're the ones collecting all the data for that. So mm -hmm. we're there. We're just there in a different way and not as visible. So we're, you know, as always, we know that. We need to do something in the interim so that we maintain um, visibility. We're not going to necessarily stay top of mind, but we don't want to just fall off. So, uh, you know, we're doing more from a, a social media perspective. Brianna and Yolanda and their team are just phenomenal when it comes to everything social media. Um, and, you know, we're looking at how we can leverage, because we're on a high right now, and we have great name recognition, and how do we keep continue to leverage on that as much as possible? You know, the next economic census will do well because it's coming off of the heels of, of the 2020 census, and people still are aware of it. So we'll utilize that any way we can, but we also have a release of data that's coming out, so we'll talk about that. In the end, it's, it's the people's data, it's not our data. And we've got people that are out there showing, showing you how to use that data how to access it, how to use it. So yes, we're doing everything we can to stay relevant without spending you know, $500 million in, in paid communications. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you very much, Kendall, Yolanda, and Brianna for joining us today and telling us about the 2020 campaign and how you all used uh, influencers to get the job done. I think it's fantastic. And we chatted out uh, your, their email. If you need to follow up with uh, the census folks, uh, give them an email and, um, a digital gov will work on getting this uh, ready for everyone the video ready for everyone and um, digital gov also noted they'll have the slides of 508 slides available as well so thank you everyone for attending this session and all the sessions this week and uh, see everybody on the internet and the listserv thanks so much take care <laughs>